Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce you now to the President of Hockey Australia, Mr Ross Sedano. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, David. So good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Melbourne Sports Centre in Parkville. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, people who might be here today. So I'll start by asking you to imagine an HQ for everything you need to know about facilities, from lobbying to construction and from everything in between. Today, Hockey Australia is excited to launch our new National Facilities Guide and Information Hub that contains resources to help our volunteers from clubs, venues and communities, as well as local councils, with a dynamic, up-to-date information relating to all facilities. We're very fortunate today to have several world exports, <laughs> exports experts with us today, including Alistair Cox, Professor Alistair Cox, who is the FIH Facilities and Quality Manager, and Martin Shepherd, Managing Director of Smart Connections, who built, authored, and reviewed our facilities resources. During this session, they will provide insight into the future direction of hockey facilities across the globe, new formats and fields, and will also officially launch our facility hub on the Hockey Australia website. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Alistair Cox. Thanks very much. Good afternoon everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we've been doing at the, uh, the FIH, the International Hockey Federation, uh, in terms of our facilities guidance and uh, standards, etc. And then Martin will explain how he's taken that work and given it an Australian theme. And then hopefully we will be able to answer your questions later. But uh, the technology works. Perfect. Um, some interesting statistics on why we're doing what we do. Um, Hockey is the third most popular team sport in the world, according to the data that we have. We did a survey, last survey we undertook was in 2018, of our member associations, and at that point in time, we estimated that over 30 million people play hockey around the world. Um, we all know the game, it's become a fast, technically skillful game, requiring good levels of personal fitness, um, it's renowned for its social inclusion, its gender equality, etc, etc. Having great facilities is key to developing the game, and that's really core to a lot of what the FIH is trying to achieve. The playing facility, the surface, I'm an engineer, I'm biased, I spent my life working with synthetic turf, but to me, if you haven't got a good field, you haven't got a good facility, the hockey is not going to develop and prosper. So ensuring we have those fields is fundamental to everything we want to achieve. So, I joined the FIH 2015. I've worked with them uh, previously in my previous career. I used to work for one of the companies that evaluate and test the products and the fields and the surfaces. Um, I was asked to come in and review what they were doing and to, to update it to making it meaningful for uh, the, the period we're now in. Um, demands on resources have been ever greater. Um, the challenges we're seeing from other sports competing for the facilities that we use in many countries. So we developed the quality program. Um, the FIH had been setting standards for synthetic turf fields for many, many years. Uh, first time we used a field was in 1976, the Montreal Olympics, uh, and they started setting standards in the late 80s. So they had a, a good history of defining what a hockey surface should be, but they recognized that it needed to bring that up to date. So the quality program is basically a three-stage, four-stage process. We set standards, which we'd like to see used internationally, defining the quality of the products, the quality of the facilities. That can be the product is the, the playing surface, it can be the lighting, it can be the goals, the, the team benches, the balls, the sticks, etc. So we set the standards to define the quality. Then we invite companies to, to join us, to join the quality program. Um, we, ex, uh, um, we audit them to make sure that they meet our criteria, we look at their quality control, the, their management systems, we make sure that they uh, are working in 
ethically acceptable ways. We don't want to partner with companies that may be using manufacturing facilities in part of the world where child labor or such things could be problems. So we, we want to make sure that the companies are um, good, wholesome com companies, shall we put it that way? Uh, and then their products are tested independently by companies that we have accredited, test laboratories, that's where I came from, uh, to make sure that they meet the development quality standards. And if they do, they are then acknowledged and allowed to use the FIH uh, quality program branding on their products and their marketing, etc. As I mentioned, we basically have three key areas of activity now. We started off with the playing surfaces. We call them hockey turfs these days. Uh, synthetic turf, astro turf, it's a particular brand, but certainly in Europe, as many people want an astro pitch, not realizing that's a, that is a specific North American product. Um, but uh, so we have, we have the requirements and the standards for the qualities of the turf, and I'll talk about those in a minute in more detail. Two or three years ago, we introduced standards for the, uh, the equipment, the field equipment, so the goals initially, then the team benches, then rebound boards, which is becoming more important with the development of hockey fives around the world, uh, and then technical officials, booths, uh, and other pieces of sort of permanent or semi-permanent infrastructure that people are investing in. And that was partly to ensure that when people were providing facilities for tournaments, the equipment was fit for purpose, but also to provide reassurance that when people are buying goals, they're buying good quality products that are A, safe, and B, going to last a reasonable period of time. That, uh, unfortunately, far too many people invest in equipment in 12, 18 months' time. They're uh, falling to pieces already. And then more recently, uh, about a year ago, we, we incorporated lighting into the quality program. And we now have uh, lighting companies who are producing high quality lighting systems to meet the, the, the standards for lighting that we have set, whether that's for tournament play or for club and community play. Uh, and we have adopted a lot of international standards for the quality of the components that make up the lighting system. So again, it's ensuring quality and longevity. Didn't want to do that. There we go. In terms of the companies, we, we, we have um, four groups of companies, really, uh, primarily. We have certified manufacturers. These are the companies who make the turf products. These are generally carpet manufacturers um, based all over the world. They make high quality hockey surfaces. They then sell those on to contractors who build the fields. Um, in some parts of the world, in some markets, it's become very successful. Others, uh, we'd like to encourage it. Uh, we have certified field builders. These are companies who have a proven ability to build hockey fields to our standards. Uh, again, we have certified equipment manufacturers. So these are the people making the goals, the, the, uh, the team benches, etc., etc., and likewise with the lighting suppliers. So we're assessing their products, but we're also assessing the competence of the companies themselves. And then we have, sorry, there we go. Then we have a group of what we call preferred turf and field suppliers. Uh, we currently have 11 of these around the world. Uh, at least three or four of them are active in the Australian market. Two of them are sitting here today, to my knowledge, so uh, uh, welcome to them. Uh, these are companies who meet the criteria of a turf manufacturer, so they make the carpets under the, under the conditions we impose. They also have the capability of designing and building the fields, so they're a field builder. Uh, they have in-house civil engineering expertise, in-house in field design expertise. Um, one of the important things for us, they are willing to take the contractual responsibility and they will do that anywhere in the world. So if we get an inquiry from a developing country where there's not a lot of expertise regarding hockey, uh, hockey facilities, maybe parts of Africa, parts of Asia, parts of South America particularly, we can refer those inquiries through to these companies and know that they're going to be handled with uh, professionally and with competence. So that's the group of companies we work with. Um, we would encourage you to, to, to look at them whenever you're uh, considering a hockey project. Looking at the standards for the hockey turf, particularly the hockey surfaces, because that's probably of greatest interest to most people, um, we have different categories of certification. 
Um, we look at the performance of the surfaces. We look at the safety of the surfaces. So we want to make sure that there's not too much grip, that there's adequate grip, they're not too hard, they're not too soft, etc., etc. So the players can perform to their, their maximum capabilities without risk of injury. Very importantly, we look at the durability and their ability to uh, sustain high levels of use for a long period of time. We look at UV degradation, that's obviously very important in climates like Australia where you have hybrid levels of UV radiation. Um, failure of carpets prematurely is something that nobody can afford. Increasingly important, uh, we're looking at the environmental compatibility of the products. Certainly in Europe, and I think in many other parts of the world, the environmental impact of using synthetic turf fields is becoming a topic of concern. Regulators are looking at synthetic turf surfaces. It doesn't matter if it's a football surface, a rugby surface, or a hockey surface. We're all being lumped together. It's synthetic turf. So its impact on the environment is increasingly becoming a concern. And that also includes the toxicology of the surfaces. We need to make sure that people playing on them are not going to be subjected to unacceptable levels of um, chemical leachings or anything, anything nasty. So every product is tested for between 30 and 40 different properties depending on the, the category it falls into. Um, they have to pass every test for the appropriate category and if they do they then get the, uh, the benefit of being uh, approved by the FIH. And we currently have over 500 hockey turfs approved from the different manufacturers in the different categories. And I'll run through those briefly now. So the top category is our global category of surfacing. Um, this is the surfacing that we will see used at all top international level hockey uh, tournaments. It's the type of surfacing that is also commonly used in many countries for the elite club level hockey. It's the wet fields, as you will, as you will see outside uh, here at the, uh, the state centre. Um, it's basically, at the moment, we require it to be a short, dense pile of carpet. We do not allow the use of an infill in the surface, and we currently require the surfacing to be irrigated. That will change as we move forward, and I'll come on to that uh, a little later. But as of today, the global category services do require water. Our second category is our national category, and these are the sand dress surfaces, which I know, talking to people today, you have a lot of those across Australia. Um, they are proving increasingly popular in many countries around the world. Um, a similar carpet to the global carpets in terms of their construction, it's a short, um, dense pile carpet. The quantity of fibre is slightly less, which allows you to put a sand dressing at the bottom. Um, that gives weight and stability to the carpet. Um, and they are very typically used in many countries for higher level club hockey, school, college hockey, etc, etc. And certainly in many climates, I mean in the UK, we have, our, our climate is renowned for being wet and damp and uh, with total justification. Although we are having a heat wave at the moment, apparently, I've been told. It's uh, 32 degrees, and it's been 32 degrees for three days, and the country is wilting, <laughs> literally. But um, generally, it, it's damp, and the sand dress carpets, when, when they are damp or moist, many club players certainly will say they can't tell the difference and between that and a top-level global surface. So they are used in many parts of the world uh, for all levels of hockey. Um, and as I say, the playing characteristics are, are considered to be quite acceptable. Thank you. We've also got a group of multi-sports surfaces. We recognise that for many people, investing in a hockey-specific surface, particularly for schools and colleges, is quite challenging. Raising the funding is difficult. So we've identified and endorsed three groups of surfaces uh, for multi-sport applications. What we call our Gen 2 surfacing is a surface that has been developed in conjunction with tennis and netball. Um, so it's suitable for community hockey, community netball, community te uh, tennis. Um, it's a similar carpet to the sand dress carpets in the, the national category, 
but it's laid on a different type of underlayer, a different type of shot pad to enable those other sports to be played. And we're finding in many communities where the need to be able to demonstrate a multi-use function to the facility, this is proving really, really popular. Um, and we, we are really encouraged by the uptake we're seeing in this in many parts of the world. Some countries still use the sound field surfaces, which are the original multi-sport surface developed in the 1990s, 2000s. It's okay for hockey, um, it's okay for football, it's not great for anything, but you know, it has its place in there. It's long lasting and it's relatively cheap. Um, and some, some markets are still asking for it, so we have standards for that level of, of that type of surfacing. We also do have a standard for the longer pile multi-sport surfacing, uh, the 3G football type surfaces. This is slightly contentious in some places because some countries really, really don't like them. And I think it's reasonable to say the hockey playing experience on them is not great. These surfaces are designed primarily for big ball sports, so for football, for, for possibly for rugby. Um, but the way that we look at it is if your community is happy playing on natural grass fields, and that is still very common in many parts of the world, you will also be happy playing hockey on one of these surfaces. But if you're in a, a hockey environment where people are predominantly playing on hockey surfaces, you probably wouldn't want to be putting one of these in. So some, some of the European associations, England hockey being an example as I'm from the UK, England hockey do not allow their competitions to take place on these surfaces. But they still go into the schools, but there's an acceptance you can't use them for club hockey. So there's a limitation to them. Um, moving on to field certification, which is, which is a key part of the, the quality programme for us. Um, we recognise that you can have the best hockey surfaces in the world if they're put onto a badly built base or if the servicing itself is badly installed, you will end up with a bad hockey field. So field certification is a way of verifying that the installation has been done correctly, the field has been built correctly and meets all the appropriate standards. Field certification is used, I think, in two ways. It's often a requirement of tournaments because they want certainty on the quality of the field that's going to be used. So certainly for all of our tournaments, we stipulate the field has to be certified in whichever category is appropriate, normally the, the top two categories. Um, but increasingly we're seeing national associations building it into their national competition regulations, so maybe the Belgian Premier League or the Dutch Premier League are two examples. The clubs competing at the top levels also have to have their fields certified, not only when they're built, but periodically through their life to ensure that they're still delivering the level of quality that people require. Um, and we basically check how the field is playing, how the field is being constructed, the levels of player safety to make sure everything is okay. So we will do it on new fields and then we will do it, as I mentioned, periodically through the life of the field to check that everything is still performing adequately and the field is still fit for purpose. And to make sure that the people operating the field are maintaining it correctly, because that's a key part of it. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, and I'm not going to say too much about this because this is the basis of the work that uh, Martin uh, is going to speak on in a minute. We have produced a number of guidance documents that are available uh, for the hockey community around the world, um, talking about different types of surfaces, how to select what type is most appropriate for your specific needs. We have lighting guidance, we have guidance on how to build outdoor hockey facilities. We have similar documentation on indoor facilities. Hockey fives, which I shall come on to in a second. Uh, and then, as I say, building facilities as well. And basically, Hockey Australia and Martin have taken our documentation and given it an Australian theme. So uh, I will be interested to see how, how the, uh, the, the transfer has taken place now that, they're, now that they're readily available. But one of the things uh, I was asked to include was a little bit about Hockey Fives, because I understand particularly Hockey Victoria is very keen to, to see the growth of Hockey Fives. We would like to see the growth of Hockey Fives around the world. Um, it's a new format of the game that we have developed to try and 
encourage more people to look at hockey, to come into hockey, to make hockey more accessible to communities. Um, I'm going to play you, if the technology works, I'll start the video in a second. We ran the first international senior hockey fires tournament about six weeks ago in uh, Lausanne in, in Switzerland. We built a temporary facility on the lakefront in the middle of the city. Stunning facility. It was built in three days. We ran the tournament over two days uh, and the whole thing had gone two days later. So it's just an example of, of what is possible uh, to showcase this form of hockey. So we are up and running. Welcome to the Hockey Bikes, everyone. Uh, an event here in Lausanne which should really entertain, be full of goals, and sitting action. So that's just a, a, a brief snapshot of what we did. Um, really brought hockey to Switzerland for the first time. Hockey is not a popular sport in Switzerland. Um, people were just dropping in. It was a public week. It was a, a long weekend. It was a public holiday that help, helped. But people were just dropping in, watching, and then they, we found they were staying for three or four hours because they were fixated with what was going on. So it showed a lot of potential for the sport, and we really want to see that uh, potential be rolled out around the world. Okay, so this is the reason why Hockey Fires has been developed. Um, the game was introduced I initially in 2014 at the Youth Olympics in Nanjing, uh, China. The Youth Olympics is meant to be a low cost, more accessible uh, Olympic competition. The IOC want the Youth Olympics to be in countries and cities that would not ever probably have the resources to bid for the full Olympic Games. So they started in Nanjing, then they went to uh, Buenos Aires and Argentina in 2018, and the next ones, it should have been last year, but clearly with COVID nothing happened, the next ones will be Senegal and Africa in 2026, that's been postponed. We were told that, that for hockey to be part of the Youth Olympics, we had to have a, a cheaper infrastructure requirement, we had to have less athletes attending because they want to keep the costs under control. So the Hockey Fires format was developed uh, and this is what we're trying to now promote around the world. It's, as it says on the slide, it is to improve access and to increase participation in hockey. Some people will play Hockey Fires and will not progress beyond Hockey Fires because they will find that's a sport for them. Others, we're sure, will start with Hockey Fives and then move on to the 11 aside version of the game. And people will switch between the two. We're quite happy, we're quite relaxed about them. We want to see both versions of the game and indoor hockey as well. So there will effectively be three versions of hockey um, available um, there that people can pick and choose which versions work for them. We don't see one as dominating over the others. So what do you need to play Hockey Fives? Um, it's relatively straightforward. We're calling it a court because it's a lot smaller than a, a full-size field. But it's, it's a pitch, it's a field, it's a court, whatever you wish to call it. It's a playing area. Um, I'll come on to that in a second. You need rebound boards. This is a key part of the game that the boards keep the ball in play, but the boards also are used tactically. The ball bounces on and off the boards. Players are passing the ball along the field using the boards 
the boards uh, as an extra player effectively uh, and you need a set of goals or two goals. So the recommended size for the facility is um, 40 meters but it can be smaller, it can be larger if you want but ideally about 40 meters in length. Um, depending on the configuration you may need to have a, um, a runoff margin outside of the boards before you get to a fence but uh, that's not essential uh, and likewise the width is 23.76 meters that's because the goal is 3.76 so it's a 20 meter plus the goals in width so the rebound boards are normally uh, two meters in length so it's basically um, a configuration of two meter boards to give us that, uh, that dimension. And you can either build hockey fires facilities on existing hockey fields, and this, these are some examples of how you can typically lay them out. So you, you, you can basically get four hockey fires fields onto a facility, either two pairs of two. If you're doing that, we would strongly recommend you have a division net along the, the center line of the field. Because um, clearly, what you don't want is balls flying off one field and striking players on the the adjacent field, um, or you can have four fields side by side along the length, um, trying to use the, the common line markings wherever possible. The line markings for hockey fives are relatively straightforward. There is a centre line down the middle. Um, ideally, there is a line in the goal mouth. Um, you don't need perimeter lines because the, the, the area is defined by the, the rebound boards and there's a penalty spot. So it's a relatively simple thing in terms of line markings. You can use temporary line markings or you can have permanent line markings on your field. Um, both of these configurations, if you wish, and you get the right type of boards, you can have um, one set of boards between two courts playing off both sides at the same time. And that's proven quite successful as you can see in the, in, in the photograph. These are facilities in uh, Cape Town in South Africa where the sport has been uh, promoted quite successfully uh, and as you can see they're basically playing two, 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 two courts alongside each other, one set of boards saves a bit of money on the cost of the boards. Thank you, there we go. What we're also starting to see is people building dedicated hockey fires facilities. So in um, locations where it may be a funding issue, this is a much smaller area, therefore it's a lot cheaper than a full size field, uh, or in areas where space is limited or alongside existing facilities. And these can either be dedicated for hockey fives, uh, as you can see in the top photograph, uh, the top illustration, or increasingly we're seeing people building a, a multi-sport area which will allow you to play hockey fives and futsal particularly those two sports go very well together futsal don't want to play on a traditional football surface because it's an indoor sport that's gone outdoors so they want a fast slick surface which is what hockey wants so hockey fives and futsal work very well together um, again, if you uh, use the configuration of the right surfacing, you can play netball and tennis on the areas as well. So there's a multi-sport function that is available with a hockey fires facility. Um, when these are being built, the rebound boards are generally incorporated into the fencing system. So they're permanently there, they're fixed, uh, creating a 24-7 a, a a, uh, facility. Uh, and likewise the goals are built in so they're permanently there so it's open to the community to use whenever they wish. Talking about the rebound boards, um, there are many many different types and I'll show these in a second but they are a very important aspect of the game. The boards are slightly contentious, there's a cost for sure, uh, there's an inconvenience of setting them up, taking them away etc etc particularly when you're using a a traditional 11 aside field so ease of installation and removal is um, very important but as I mentioned earlier having good rebound and consistent rebound off the boards from our perspective is a very important part of hockey fives this is how we want the game to be played uh, and this is what players seem to like so having the right characteristics from the board is, is quite important um, ease of installation is important 
Um, some of the boarding systems are pretty heavy and cumbersome and that makes it difficult and time consuming and you can't get younger play players to get the, the juniors to set them up because there's, there's obviously health and safety considerations. Um, so we have set some standards for the boards. This is what we would insist on for our tournaments. This is what we would encourage people to use when they are hosting higher level tournaments but we would recommend people look at this criteria when they're buying boards for their own clubs or communities. So just to illustrate the different types of products out there on the market, the figure at the top left, uh, the picture at the top left, that was the arena in Buenos Aires for the Youth Olympics. Um, it was a temporary facility constructed uh, at the uh, Olympic Sports Park in Buenos Aires. Um, but the boards are semi-permanently installed, they're in sockets which were built into the base of the field. Um, great rebound, the boards remain dead straight for two weeks, they didn't move because they're socketed. But they are effectively a permanent installation or semi-permanent installation. Great for tournament play, maybe not so suitable for other applications. Below that we have um, a range of products being used. I mean. Some people will use timber boards, that's probably the cheapest option, but the rebound's pretty inconsistent, um, they're cumbersome and heavy to set up, so there are some limitations, maybe cost overweighs that. Um, plastic piping has been used, but again the rebound is pretty unsatisfactory, so it's really a ball containment mechanism as opposed to uh, a rebound mechanism. But companies now are producing um, the, b the bottom uh, left hand picture here, these were the boards that we used in Lausanne. Um, it's a dense uh, foam structure with a uh, connecting mechanism. So basically they're very lightweight, so it's safe for young people to move around, they're easy to handle. It takes, this was the first time it had ever been set up. Um, we did some trials with the, with the England uh, under 21 squad. Um, Myself and three others, I think it was three of us, maybe two of us, we set that course up in about 25, 30 minutes. We'd never done it before. We were not experts. I'm sure we could do it in less time moving forward. But it, it was relatively quick and simple. They just, they, they just connect together. Um, yes, okay, over a period of play, they, they move a little bit. There's a, there's a little bit of distortion along the boundaries, but you can kick them back into place nice and quickly. And that's proving a fairly popular system. Uh, certainly company, countries who are investing in these boards in Europe, that's what they're buying at the moment, primarily. So in our guidance documents, I'm not sure if this has got copied into the Australian versions or not. Um, I'll let Martin <laughs> refer to that in a second. But we have produced some guidance on which category. So we have three, sorry, we have two categories of FIH approved boarding. The category one is the, the permanent installation, if you like, um, where things are very robust, aren't going to move, going to stay in place. There's no weight limit on that. The category two is a lighter weight board, is a lightweight board, easy to install, easy to move around, can be lower in height. Ideally, the board should be 250 millimeters high, but we, uh, we acknowledge that in many cases, Primarily for cost, people will go down to 150 millimetres. That's okay for the class two. But what we're increasingly seeing is products like the ones I, I illustrated earlier, as you can see there on the on the trolley. That's one set of boards for a field or a course. Uh, they meet the criteria both for class one and class two. So good performance, lightweight, easy to use. And then finally, um, I was asked to provide a little bit of an update on some of the environmental issues that hockey has been uh, asked to address alongside all the other users of synthetic turf surfaces. Some of these issues are specific to hockey, some of them are more general. Um, so I will start with the first one, which I'm sure is the one that is most important or a primary concern to most people here today, the use of non-watered non-irrigated, I, I was given a good phrase this morning, I, I acknowledge that, um, non-irrigated turfs use at the highest levels of hockey, our global category turfs. So 
Hockey, since we first played on synthetic turf in Montreal in 1976, has always used wet surfaces at the elite level of the game. Uh, it was probably almost by chance initially that we found that when the surfaces were wet, they had better performance. But having found that, the sport became wedded to the idea of a wet surface providing the best optimum playing conditions. And I don't think anybody disputes that at all. Um, a wet field is by far the best playing surface. But however, in many parts of the world, and I know you've experienced this in Australia, water is becoming another scarce commodity. Um, in many countries, the cost of an irrigation system, or the cost of the water, and this is certainly a, an issue back home in the UK, the cost of the water is becoming increasingly prohibitive, and that is becoming a major deterrent to people investing in hockey facilities. And we also know that insisting, insisting on wet fields at the elite level is creating barriers which might ultimately threaten our, our Olympic participation as a sport. That we need to be a global sport accessible around the world and if we have criteria that certain parts of the world struggle to achieve because they haven't got water, that is going to threaten potentially hockey's position within the Olympic movement. So in 2018, it was announced by, uh, didn't want to do that, sorry. Um, let me just go back onto this. There we go. So in 2018, it was announced by our, our president and uh, at our Congress um, in India that we, the FIH, were challenging the uh, synthetic turf industry looking at the representatives here today uh, and, and their colleagues around the world to develop surfaces that have the characteristics of wet turfs but don't require water. And we hoped at that point that we would be able to use those surfaces by the Paris Olympics in 2024. Uh, clearly that was in 2018 and about 18 months later Covid came along and everybody ground to a halt for two years. So. The reality is that uh, we lost two years R&D, the manufacturers lost two years R&D, uh, and Paris will not be on a totally dry surface. But we strongly believe that the World Cups, wherever they may be, and I acknowledge that Australia has a bid in at the moment, uh, no decisions made, but wherever the World Cups will be in 2026 will be on non-water turfs. And ultimately, I think our primary objective has always been the recognition with the Olympics in 2028 in California in Los Angeles California has a major water issue for us to turn up in LA and demand four hockey fields that we were going to put thousands of liters of water on was going to be a hard sell and again we don't want to compromise or jeopardize our potential to be participating in the LA so our objective is always to have a proven surface available for the LA Olympics in 28. So we set out a bit of a roadmap defining what, what needs to be done. Um, first thing the manufacturers rightly said to us is, so what do you require? And in a way, we knew what we wanted, but we couldn't quantify it because we'd always said the fields have to be wet. Therefore, we don't need to measure things that we know are OK. But we've had to develop new testing procedures to evaluate the surfaces to define the characteristics that we really require. That will enable the manufacturers to develop the new surfaces, the new technology, and we, we know that companies are working on this. The surface that we used in Lausanne for the Hockey Fives six weeks ago was a prototype product for the dry turf technology, or the non-water technology, I should say. Um, a key part of this process will be to get the players to evaluate the surfaces as they become available on the marketplace. We need player feedback. I'm an engineer, so I can rely on all the testing data in the world, but it doesn't matter what I say. If the players say it's rubbish, their view is going to have far more weight and conviction than, than my view. So we need player feedback, but obviously we need the products out there, out there for them to evaluate. As they feedback to us, and as the manufacturers develop products, we will be able to define a level of acceptability. As a sport, ideally, the new technology will match the existing technology and the players will be able to switch between the two without any difficulties. 
probably there will be some differences and we will then have to hold discussions with the hockey community to get their buy-in that the, the differences are acceptable because of the benefits in terms of sustainability uh, etc are accepted by everybody and certainly the conversations I've had uh, the ad hoc conversations I've had so far <coughs> with the players a I think you know I due respect to the younger people in the audience people of my generation are probably less environmentally aware as people my son is a lot more environmentally aware than me I would say let me put it that way and when I talk to the elite players and explain how much water we use every time we hold a tournament, they're absolutely horrified. They are really, really shocked at the quantities of water that, that are used during regular hockey sessions when you're watering the fields. So I think they will be willing to accept some changes in the playing characteristics if that is required to enable us to move to surfaces that don't require irrigating. There we go. So today, as I mentioned, our standards require the surfaces to be watered, uh, and that meant we didn't need to measure things. But moving that requirement, we need to be able to measure the ball surface interaction, the stick surface interaction, uh, etc. So we've done a piece of research with Loughborough University in the UK and LaboSport, which is one of our accredited test institutes who are based all over the world. Uh, and they basically went out and consulted with many players uh, and, and have identified the characteristics of our key and have then developed testing methods for us to measure those properties. So they've gone through, there we go. So they went out and identified the uh, likes and dislikes. Why do players like wet turf? Why do they dislike playing on dry turf? They did that in a uh, fairly robust academic process. They did some focus groups initially with players based at the university. Loughborough University is one of the top sporting universities in the UK. Have a lot of international players based there. They did the focus groups. They then compiled questionnaires and timing was very fortuitous. We sent the questionnaires out to all the teams competing at the Tokyo Olympics last year uh, and asked them when you're sitting in isolation, doing your quarantine in, J in Japan or wherever, would you like to spend half an hour filling this questionnaire for us? And uh, if I was being honest, I thought when they sent it out, if we got 25, 30 responses, we would be doing well. We got 237 responses from elite players. And the split was perfect. We had about 10% from goalkeepers, defenders, etc., etc. So we got really good representation of male and female players, from all of the teams around the world, um, from all positions on the field. And from that, we could identify in a, uh, a robust way, this is, these are the positives and negatives of dry turf and wet turf. Having understood that, um, we were then able to analyze those particular um, parts of hockey, playing the game, we were, able, we were able to go into the biomechanics lab and analyze what the players were doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that has enabled them to develop a series of tests that measure precisely how the ball is interacting with the surface or how the player is interacting with the surface in a way that we can do repeatedly that will enable the different manufacturers to test their products in the laboratory to see if they're heading in the right direction. And once they've got that completed, uh, and the products come into the market, we will be able to endorse them as meeting our standards uh, to give the consumers the confidence that the products being placed in the market are acceptable. So the report was published in May. It's gone to all the manufacturers. A number of national associations had a copy of hockey. I accept the timing wasn't great for Hockey Australia and when we held the webinar. It's uh, unfortunately, but uh, if you're not there, we can happily let you have a copy of the report but we have introduced new tests for the pace of the surfacing, for the way the ball rebounds from the surface, stick friction, and the suitability for the 3D skills, which are the key parameters that the players have identified for us. And what is happening today is the manufacturers going back to the basics of the yarns, the polymers that make up the surface, the plastics that make up the surfaces. The chemists are doing lots of clever things that are beyond me, but 
They sound impressive. Um, that is allowing development in yarn technology, development in carpet technology and shop pad technology. They're now able to go to the laboratories and have those products analysed in the lab, small scale. Is it looking positive? Is it looking good? If it is, they can get player trials organised. Um, if that's all good, then we will subject them to the, the longer term durability weathering test because clearly we want these fields to be long term. They need to go out there and last 10, 15 years because it's going to be a big investment as it, uh, as it already is. Um, and uh, hopefully one or more companies will be able to provide the solutions we're looking for in a relatively short period of time. <coughs> and what we need to do, as I mentioned, is we know that the dry turfs today are not good enough. We know that the wet turfs today are perfect, if you like, as good as they're going to be. We will need to define, in consultation with the hockey community, um, what we consider to be an acceptable surface. Ideally, that will be as close to the right-hand side of the screen as possible. Time will tell. Um, and as I mentioned and showed earlier, the tournament in, in Lausanne was the first international hockey tournament on a dry surface, or on a non-watered surface, I should say. Um, the feedback was positive. There were some limitations, but generally the feedback was positive. I don't think we've got there yet, but we're heading in the right direction. Um, so we are confident by 2026 we will have a good solution. Um, so as I said earlier, um, we will update our standards in due course to include this new criteria. We're not saying that you cannot use water, so anybody who has a wet turf today, anybody who wants to continue using wet turf in the future, and some countries' water are not an issue. Uh, the Netherlands springs to mind, they're fairly convinced that they will continue to use wet surfaces. That's perfectly okay, we're not going to stop that. What we want to do is introduce a choice so that if people want to use a surface that doesn't require water for elite level hockey, they have that option. And um, we will endorse those products as we currently do, as I mentioned, to bring the reassurance to the, uh, to the market. Where are we? Okay. And then very briefly, that's the sort of time scale that we're envisaging. Uh, World Cup in 2024 for Hockey Fives will be in Oman. We can't go to the desert and use a, and use a wet surface. That, that clearly would be very unsustainable. So we will uh, we will use dry turf in Oman in 2024. Men's and Women's World Cups in 2026. That needs to be determined, as I mentioned, and also Senegal Youth Olympics. Those are all fairly fixed with the objective of being in LA. Um, in 2028 with a wet surface. And then I'm very conscious of time, so let me speed up a little bit. I'm gonna blame Andrew for asking me to put hockey fives into the presentation. Sorry, David, I, I, was, I, just, I just threw just through these. Just to make people aware, because it is important that um, generally synthetic turf is under the spotlight, certainly in Europe. The regulators in Europe, the European Commission, are increasingly looking at all sources of environmental pollution, microplastics, they have identified synthetic turf as a potential source of this. You can argue whether it is or it isn't, but unfortunately it's in their, it's in their, their thinking, so we have to be aware of that and we have to respond to that. Um, the circular economy, again, is a, a concept that is increasingly being promoted by governments around the world. We need to make things to enable us to reuse them. So when it reaches end of life, it can be processed and converted back into the product for the second time, a third time, a fourth time. What they don't want is the linear economy where you make something, you use it, you throw it away when it's uh, reached the end of life. So we are working very closely with the European Synthetic Turf Council, which is the trade association in Europe, who are developing ways of analysing and validating that people are doing this uh, correctly. And we, we already have good products out there. The shop pads are made generally from recycled materials and they are usable for two or three carpets for 20 plus years. Um, the carpets are increasingly being made from environmentally friendly polymers. Um, they are increasingly being made in a way that aids recycling, which is positive, and like the, likewise <coughs> the base constructions are um, 
increasingly using recycled aggregates and, and materials coming from other industries that otherwise would have gone into landfill disposal. Microplastics is a big issue for the synthetic turf industry. Um, we have to ensure that synthetic turf hockey fields are not polluting the environment, otherwise the, the environmental lobbyists will be picking on hockey. Football, the different codes of football are already experiencing this in Europe. Um, the rubber granular they use in their surfaces is potentially going to be banned in Europe because it seems to be a major source of microplastic pollution. Hockey doesn't want to have the same problems that football potentially will have in terms of fibre wear. So our standards are already trying to ensure good quality, robust um, products. But moving forward, we are convinced that we will have to improve the maintenance that we undertake on these fields so that as the fibres do degrade, and they will degrade eventually, it may not be for 15, 20 years, but they will degrade, that when we get to that point, we are basically cleaning the fields, vacuuming the fields, sucking up all the fibre debris, because at the moment, as the fibre wears, nobody collects it. It gets dispersed into the environment. And that's clearly not an, uh, an acceptable or sustainable position for, for any operator of a hockey field to, to maintain. So maintenance will become increasingly important. And then uh, finally, end of life disposal. All of these carpets have a finite life. Uh, and increasingly we are, as an industry, we are facing pressure to ensure that they are disposed of responsibly. We have a thing in, the, in Europe called the waste hierarchy. This, this again came from the European Commission. Um, at the bottom, disposal, landfill, which is historically where most of these carpets have ended up. Uh, we are being told that's no longer acceptable. Uh, repurposing is second use of the products. That has some merit. But ultimately, all you're doing is transferring the responsibility to somebody else. Uh, and there is certainly a view that if you cut a hockey field up into many small pieces, you're making the control of that final disposal a lot harder. So ideally, we don't want to see products being repurposed. It's okay repurposing it for further hockey use, but don't sell it to the local farmer or the golf course or the horse track or whatever it might be, because when they've got, got to, uh, to the end of it, then there's a problem. So ideally we want to see products being recycled. Uh, this is where the industry needs to get to and at the FIH we are actively working with companies and encouraging them to do this. There are two forms of recycling currently being used around the world. Mechanical recycling, which is where the carpets are taken, processed, cut up and made into um, plastic granulate that can be, then be used to make uh, plastic decking, boards to go around the perimeters of fields, that sort of applications or chemical recycling, which is where the plastics are taken, processed back into hydrocarbon oils that then enable you to make new plastics, etc. And this is technology, there's certainly a, lot, there's a large plant being built at the moment in the UK based on technology that was developed at the University of Sydney. And there's a pilot plant up there which we have sent hockey surfaces to for processing. So slightly over time for which I apologise, but that's me done. I shall take some questions later. I think it's the schedule. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, David. <coughs> Thanks so much, Alistair. That's uh, amazing and a lot to take in. Um, and which takes us to the next piece of our uh, day, which is our new guides. And these guides are being created to help you navigate uh, what you've just heard. That presentation you've just seen will be available. We'll send it all to you via our link and uh, you'll be able to watch it back, of course, on livehockey.com.au. But the guides we've created, there's a, we're starting with eight. Um, they will be dynamic guides that will be available and updated regularly, and we'll add to them. Because as you heard from Alistair just then, sustainability in the environment is, is going to be crucial and more crucial as we head towards 2032, where the um, Brisbane Games will be a, a climate zero, so there will be no uh, effect on the climate by Brisbane 2032. So we're going to have to get our, uh, our game in order. Um, so now to hand you over to Martin Shepherd, who has brought our guides together, um, and as I said, we will keep building on these, keep improving them, and keep adding to them, so we put facility expertise 
in your hands. So thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you've heard um, today, Hockey Australia is committed to growing the game uh, locally, regionally, uh, in the cities and out in the regions. To do that, we need to be able to provide advice, support and guidance to local government, who are primarily the purchasers, state government, who are some of the key supporters in terms of funding, local clubs and associations to enhance the way that they think and bring them in line with, as Alistair said, said some of the um, standards and approaches that are going on um, globally now. The guides aim to uh, raise awareness of some key principles for the building, the planning, the management, the maintenance of the facilities, both from the overall facility, the field of play and the equipment that goes with them. The end outcome that we really want is to enhance the experience the players, spectators, fans and the administrators have on the field so that we can actually improve and increase the number of people who want to be part of the hockey family whether that's just watching or playing. As David said the guides are really only the first step in this process and what we're aiming to do is update these on an annual basis starting at the beginning of 2023 and what we want is all of the hockey family to identify what we can improve within the game in terms of the facilities giving us tips asking us more questions sharing challenges that you've all had actually out there in the field playing challenges that you're again throw from local government in terms of barriers for you actually building your courts building your fields or how it's managed to maintain. And then Hockey Australia's commitment is to address those in the next set of guides to come out next year. We're also looking for case studies of where it's been done well, for best practice around Australia, or indeed from other areas around the globe that you've seen have worked and you think could work here. So we really want to look at the innovations of how that happens. So the eight guides that we've got in our first instalment cover the areas of irrigation, lighting, the building of the fields, the standards needed which Alice has gone through and we've, should we say, put the Australian bent on them uh, for that side, um, the use of hockey fives as a fast growing dynamic sport especially, especially for young people and for uh, the seasons when you're not playing the full game and indoor hockey is still to be developed and we're working on that with some hockey people at the moment. But the last guide we've got is actually called the Hockey Revolution and the idea behind this is simple. At the moment the football codes are ahead of hockey in terms of working with local government to get the fields that they need. Hockey isn't getting as much of a look in and we want to change that. We've been working with uh, Vic Health who have done uh, the first part of the research around Victoria and what are the challenges that young people are having in terms of participating in physical activity, recreation, play and community sports. Their findings have been embraced by Hockey Australia in developing this guide and what we're trying to do is work with local governments and state governments and reposition hockey fields so we can get more hockey fields out into the community. So instead of just having hockey fields where a club has to have 300 members to be able to justify it, what we're looking to do is work with local governments to develop youth hubs where local youth, local young people can play a range of sports. And as Alistair started to touch on before, we really want to try and do this differently. We want to try and be able to show that hockey fields with Gen 2 can actually work for different sports. For futsal, for soccer, for baseball, for netball, for tennis as well. And by doing that, what we're going to be doing is going to the local government and saying we can develop youth hubs with Gen 2 surfaces for the whole of your community, the whole of your young community, with hockey as being the backbone of how we do that. 
We believe that will then open up the need for more Gen 2 hockey fields around Australia. Even if your clubs have only got 100 or 200 members, this will start a whole new dynamic of getting more hockey fields around the country. And that's what the hockey revolution is all about. We know that the sporting generation is changing. And if we keep saying and doing the same thing, we'll only get the same results. We need to think differently. So Hockey Australia is providing foresight, a solution to challenge the norm by creating environments to encourage young people to play the sport. And these are some of the ways that we're doing it. So we want to connect recreation, we want to connect a broader young community, and we want to have hockey as the centerpiece for those hubs. A while ago, I was in the last couple of weeks, I was speaking to two CEOs of local governments in New South Wales, and I was talking to them about if we were to provide them with a surface that could actually play soccer, tennis, netball, um, and hockey on it, and futsal, would they be interested? And they jumped at the opportunity to learn more. I deliberately didn't say it was a hockey surface until I got them excited. Once they're excited about having a solution for their young people to play, we can then say we can give them a tenant sport through hockey clubs to be able to provide that. They were really excited about doing that. So we have a new opportunity now for sport to play on a hockey surface and not just hockey to play on that surface. That will change the numbers of people who want to play sports in a local area and then hopefully the hockey clubs can convince them to play hockey fives and then hockey as well. So I think this is a really good initiative from Hockey Australia to take it out to the whole Australian community, both around the cities and in the regions. We commend Hockey Australia for this initiative and what we'd like to do now is bring Alistair back up for some questions and also to join Alistair will be David Burke who is a stand-in, a very capable stand-in for Andrew Skillen as the Hockey Victoria CEO who uh, has got COVID and didn't want to share it yep. with all of us. So please thank Andrew for uh, his generosity of not coming in. <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions, um, if I may I'll start with, um, with Alistair. Uh, Alistair, you told us a lot of uh, the global initiatives around and a lot of innovation in terms of hockey and where it's going forwards. How would you encourage the Australian hockey family to embrace them and where should we start? Start with an easy question. Um, I think certainly the development of the multi-sport surface that is hockey friendly is fairly fundamental. Um, so many people struggle to not only raise the funding to build the facility in the first place, but to then set the money aside to sustain that facility for many, many decades. You know, it's, it's not easy, but it's relatively simple to get that initial funding. But when you're faced with a large bill in 12 years time or 15 years time, whatever it may be, to resurface that facility, if you haven't been setting aside a significant sum of money every year from day one, then you've got a big problem. If you get more people using the facility, you're going to be able to raise more income to have that sinking fund, so hopefully when the resurfacing is required, you can fund it. So I would definitely say that multifunctional, multi-sport uh, approach is at the community level, that's where people need to be heading to, 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 to make it economically viable. Yeah, I think I agree wholeheartedly there. Give you an example up in, um, uh, well, north of Melbourne, should we say, and um, there's a hockey surface, a hockey club's got three um, surfaces, and they charge futsal for six weeks, $60,000 to play. So that can be your whole reinvestment fund every year to invest so in 12 years time you can replace that. Just by bringing in, in January, February, and March, another sport to play on the surfaces. So that's the type of innovation that we really need to have by partnering with other sports. How about Hockey Fives? Where do you think we should start for that? I think, again, Hockey Fives, it's, it's got two audiences. It, it's, it's another form of hockey for the clubs to get young people coming into the clubs to, to, to be introduced to hockey. But I think it, it, it's also a totally different form of hockey. It's exciting, it's vibrant, it's easy to play, the rules are simple. 
Um, a lot of people, I think if you come from the hockey community, if your parents played hockey, you will go to the hockey club, you will join the hockey family. But if your parents aren't in that community, it's quite intimidating to go along to the hockey club. Um, well, I think Hockey Fives removes a lot of that intimidation. It's less structured, it's less formal, it's easier to understand, it's more enjoyable for, for, for novice players. So I think it's, it is a key way of getting introducing people to the game. And I don't think we shouldn't be too precious about it. People will come, some will take it up, some will leave, some will move on, some will go to the 11 aside game, some will stay. But get people trying the game and picking it up. Because at the moment, as you say, there were so many other activities out there. Everyone is competing. I mean, the, the National Sports Convention we've just had, all these sports are all trying to take the same people to play football or rugby or netball or cricket. We're all competing for the same group of players. We've got to make it appealing to them. I agree. If I can move over a bit there to Dave now. In terms of we were talking earlier on about the hockey revolution and using hockey fives and bringing in the youth, where's Hockey Victoria and where do you think Hockey Australia needs to focus to achieve that? Yeah, it's a great question and I, and I think we're in a really interesting space as a sport and an environment in Victoria, certainly in New South Wales and in Australia with what we've all just gone through in the last two years and, and Hockey Fives presents a real opportunity, um, there's no doubt about that. In many ways we've trialled a number of different formats, looked at things like in Victoria, J-ball, hockey sixes, etc. We've had indoor hockey um, on the side. We play that in summer, indoors in summer and outdoors in winter. And um, We need to use hockey fives um, as an opportunity to re-engage, to provide that opportunity in areas, um, if at all regionally or in, in communities where either we can't afford a full pitch, um, whether we can put a, a hockey fives pitch in, um, that we don't need 11 a side and that, that's the, the, the really simple opportunity is that smaller numbers, smaller smaller risks, smaller um, amount of work for volunteers etc to do that. Um, speaking to facility utilisation, four pitches on the one standard size so our return for on investment is far more significant. It just it, it makes sense in many regards. So. And in terms of the multi-sport uh, that we've already spoken about and the Gen 2 surface, how do you think that'll be embraced by the hockey community? Yeah, I think if um, we were talking to any hockey club and I was out at a hockey club um, committee meeting and was talking about multi-purpose, um, there might be a few um, daggers thrown my way and said, um, how dare you talk about multi-purpose, which is absolutely fair enough. We want to fight for, for hockey pitches first and foremost, there's no doubt about that. But ultimately we've got to be pragmatic, we've got to say, okay, well, the money's not always there to be dedicated 100% to, to hockey. So use the opportunities that exist that are right there in front of you, work with other sports. There's plenty of great examples. We've got a number of facilities in Victoria that are primarily school-based, um, that are multi-lined, a tennis court lined. Um, the Hume Centre um, was initially developed to be the hockey and lacrosse centre. Um, so we can't be naive. We've got to be open to the opportunity. Um, and if it presents itself, we've got to grab it and, and make sure that we have a presence first and foremost. Um, and I think, as Alistair as said, not to be too picky about it. Yeah, and, and I think hockey's just reflecting some of the football codes. So 10 years ago when they put synthetic fields in, they wouldn't let any other sport play on them. They wouldn't allow any other markings. But now they're making so much money out of other sports, it's actually keeping the community clubs going. And it actually stops them going into pokies and other things. So I actually think by combining with the sports, it's a great way of moving forward. Just keeping it on that in terms of um, the, the small courts, we're seeing a lot of local government, Dave, you know, putting small courts in for tennis. Have you got a experience in terms of where that's been expanded now to bring in hockey fives or that type of surface? Uh, not so much in, in Victoria at the moment, so but certainly something that we would, would like to see explored, again, particularly in regional areas where the reality is community size doesn't allow for the full investment so again let's get a hockey fives pitch in there let's make sure the sport's being played first and foremost um, and go from there yeah and i know you've done a lot of work and um, recently with the state government and looking at new land like caulfield race course yep. and what's your strategy about working with clubs and associations to get more land for hockey yeah absolutely so uh, and a couple of good examples at the moment so caulfield race course if, if ever there was a location for three hockey pitches and a hockey fives pitch which will We'll take every day of the week. Um, there's some work happening out through the peninsula area, so to, to find a, a home for Frankston and Mornington Peninsula down the track. Um, 
look, there's, I suppose, twofold. One, we're trying not to be reactive to, to needs, so where school facilities disappear and, and so on, but also um, working in areas where, again, there's the demand that's been built up. So down to Keyway, um, Peter Stewart here from, from Geelong, so obviously great result that we're going to Geelong for the Com Games and so on. Um, so looking at those opportunities to, yeah, to develop the pitches. And we heard earlier on about Alistair showed us the example over in Switzerland about um, getting the, the drop in. Um, how do you think that would work in Victoria? I know in a fives context, I think it would be great to, to have an exhibition of, of that nature. I think if we, um, I'll throw it out there, if we could ever use something like Amy Park for an event, um, have a, a blockbuster there with a drop in. The challenge in Victoria is always going to be the space and the, the other competing events. So um, I think it has great potential. Um, it's about whether or not we can get the right event and the right timing to, to make sure it works. Yeah, I can just imagine in Geelong or even in Burke Street Mail having a hockey spike in there when there's yeah. thousands of people walking in. That'd be brilliant for the sport, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Ge Geelong, can we have a up there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's we've, a we've yes. Been, we've been thinking hockey five <coughs> in various contexts. Yep. Um, perhaps not as a replacement for elevens, yep. but in in other ways of, of recruiting. Mm. And um, you know, you bring to mind a, a certain part of the foreshore in Geelong <laughs> that could be pretty <laughs> spectacular. So, because you have no one else got the mic, uh, the summary is uh, Geelong would be very keen as a as a recruitment tool, but also on the foreshore with the backdrop, maybe not as you have in Switzerland, <laughs> but maybe close to that. I think that'd be really exciting. So, what I might do now uh, for the last few minutes is just open the floor up if there's any questions for both Alistair or Dave in terms of either the facility guides or indeed uh, where the innovation is going for the sport and how we go forwards. I'd just like to ask a question to Alistair if I could, just in, in regard to Hockey Fives, the rebound boards, I was quite, I was quite interested to see the photos given um, I know the, um, the placement of fences beyond or the runoff areas for normal hockey grounds and, uh, and I know the beauty of indoor boards is that they're, they're not so much fixed, they've got a little bit of flexibility should players hit them, but the ones in the in the Hockey Fives look quite rigid and I'm just wondering how do you get around that from a health and safety point of view? That is a good question. Uh, the boards that we used in Lausanne, there was a little bit of movement in them. Um, the space between them and the fencing was fairly narrow. The, we had a lake on one side and uh, a, a stream, a pair, a feature on the other side, so we were, we were totally landlocked. Um, we also had quite a pronounced slope to make life even more challenging or interesting, but as people said, it's Switzerland. If you want to play on a flat field, go to the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, safety's got to be considered. Um, the, the configuration we used in Buenos Aires is where the boards were fixed. Um, what we found is that players would actually sort of jump over them. If they, if they realised they weren't going to stop, they were just stepping over them, which is why the height is kept at that level. And we did have a good two, three metre runoff at that facility to enable them to then safely stop before they uh, got to the, uh, the spectator fencing. And I guess the, the purpose built ones are, are high enough, they're almost like futsal courts where the walls are high enough that they rebound off the walls. Anyway. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> so it's basically part of the fence line, so it's typically a three metre high fence. So, exactly, it's uh, certainly in Europe, we have a lot of five side football areas where they will play off the walls, so it's quite a common p procedure uh, and technique. So, yeah, it's, players adapt to what the situation is, and safety is not compromised. Yeah, and, and just, just one other comment just for the fact for, for a drop in surface, my, um, my nephew happened to work in Dubai for a couple of years, and he's, he's a hockey player. and uh, they had a hockey a hockey tournament in Dubai where they laid synthetic turf over the ice over the ice rink. Um, so and he said it, he said it worked just as good as any other hockey surface. Uh, so absolutely. there you go. There's just putting it out there. Yeah, and, and what we haven't really <laughs> mentioned, which we should do, acknowledging, is the drop in full size pitches that uh, we used in London and Dublin in 2019 at for the for the FIH Pro League and for the Olympic qualifiers, where we built a full size field in a in two rugby stadium, one on natural turf, one on synthetic, and again we were in and out in a relatively, sh you know, within ten days we'd gone and built a full-size field 
So when these guys say they want 20 weeks to build a field, you know, they can do it in 10 days. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the technology is there to enable us to go and utilize existing stadium. So that's going to enable us to take international hockey, high level international tournaments to venues that previously we couldn't contemplate. I, I think uh, okay. uh, with the part aside, um, what's the joining mechanism for the, the boards that you're using? So the boards, I mean, there are different products out there, but the boards we used in Lausanne, it's basically um, a 250 millimeter square foam block with a hole for the middle and there's a metal bar that goes through and is just pinned together. So as I say, it's, it's, it's lightweight, it's simple, half an hour of erected. We wanted something ideally that the PE staff could set up, you know, run a session of hockey fires and clear the field and put it back to whatever other sport they were going to use without major inconvenience. You could easily use a rope, a la the cricket boundary ropes, through that foam as well. You, you could, would yeah, give absolutely. flexibility to easily manage yeah. things. What, one of the things that people, I suppose it's more at the higher level, is trying to keep them straight so when the camera's mm -hmm. looking down it's, it's not a dog's leg. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. Alistair, you spoke about the move away from wet pitches, but there's still being flexibility for countries perhaps that have more access to water to be able to continue that. Do you see though the FIH role in having tournaments played off wet pitches as being critical in trying to, I guess, go at some of those yeah. Lego countries to actually adopt the technology? Yeah, I, I think our standards, as I mentioned, we will end up in a situation saying that's the level of performance we need for that top category of hockey. How you as a manufacturer achieve that is entirely up to you. But we will start riding into our uh, tournament requirements. So you're, when you're bidding for the World Cups 2030, shall we say, um, it will be saying it's on a dry turf. Um, and we will start to stipulate that we, we will want to use non-water turfs. And what, you know, that's partly deliberately because it will then encourage all the major national associations. You will need to invest in that technology so your players have the opportunity to experience it before you go to a World Cup or the Olympic Games, wherever it is. So we don't want you know, people are buying or installing fields today. We don't want to we don't want to deter them doing that on the basis that they're putting in technology that's going to become obsolete in three, four, ten years time. But I would be very surprised if in 15 years time people are using wet fields um, I would have retired by then so <laughs> this won't be my responsibility but yeah no, I'm pretty sure that and we think probably that the market the choice of products on the market will in terms of the different categories that will contract that if you can have a surface that's good enough for elite hockey doesn't require water hasn't got all that cost maybe you don't need to think about the sound dress carpets etc so I can see this, the choice being simpler for the hockey communities. Okay, thanks for that, Dave. I'd like to hand back to you. <coughs> so thank you to our uh, virtual audience and our physical audience for being with us today. Um, thank you very much to Alistair, Professor Alistair Cox. Thank you very much, Martin Shepherd and Dave. Thank you for joining in today and thank you for coming. And um, this is the start of a journey and this is the start of us um, at, at being able to help you as much as we can in what is a very, a very difficult uh, process, which is building, constructing, lobbying for facilities. So we're here to help. And um, for those who are watching this in, in the next month or two months, uh, send us an email if you need some help. Thank you very much. Sure.